In our study of the book of Revelation, we come this morning to the second of seven letters from Jesus. And I would summarize this letter this way. Jesus, writing to the church at Smyrna, says, I know the difficulty you are undergoing, and it will get worse. That's the letter. It's interesting to think about the kinds of pressures that faithful churches are under in our day. If you subscribe to Voice of the Martyrs, you are bombarded week after week with stories from our day of those who suffer for Christ. If you're a reader of church history, you know those who have bled and been burnt at the stake and fed to wild animals for their faithfulness to Christ. And we here in North America in the 20th and 21st centuries have had it easy so far. And no doubt individual Christians have faced individualized persecutions from family, in the workplace. But as our nation grows increasingly hostile to Christ and to the truth, the persecutions will step up. Sufferings for Christians will become more commonplace, and this letter for us will be timely. The passage we're studying this morning is a letter of encouragement to a church under pressure. I've titled the sermon this morning, Faithful Under Fire, because that pressure would get more intense for the recipients of this letter. Consider our English word encouragement for just a moment. Break it apart. Encouragement. Encouragement is that which brings courage. And don't confuse encouragement with flattery or good vibes. Flattery would be, you got what it takes, man. Good vibes is, hey, I just need some positivity. Only tell me good things. That's not biblical encouragement. When does a soldier need encouragement? When does he need courage? When he goes to face enemy fire to accomplish the task that the commanding officer has before him. Christians, we need courage in our day. The letter to Smyrna is just that. We're in this study of letters to seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3. This is the second of such letters. Uh, The slide on the screen just reminds us where we are in our Bibles and in our geography. (laughs) You remember that John the Apostle is on the island of Patmos, off the coast of what is called Asia Minor. That is the Roman province of Asia. We think of Asia as like Russia and China. Uh, In the Roman Empire, this little piece of land was called Asia Minor. And and on that piece of land are seven churches that John had been around, been a shepherd amongst for three decades. And Jesus gives letters to these churches through the Apostle John. And this second letter is to Smyrna. Smyrna is... The modern city of Izmir, Turkey, it's the only of the seven cities that still exists to this day. It is 35 miles north of Ephesus, and we'll describe the city of Smyrna more as we talk through the letter. This is the shortest letter, and we will call this church Faithful Under Fire. You remember last week, the church at Ephesus was the church that had abandoned its first love. This is a church with a different flavor. Faithful under fire. Let's read Jesus' letter to this church. Verse 8, Revelation 2. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write The first and the last, who was dead and has come to life, says this I know your tribulation and your poverty, yet you are rich. And the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews but are not. They are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for ten days. 
Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. Our outline for this morning just follows the the pattern of all the letters to the churches, six elements of Jesus' evaluation, this time of the church at Smyrna. Our outline will reflect that same structure, a salutation, a commendation, a confrontation, a command, a plea, and a promise. Let's look first at the salutation. This is the greeting, the beginning of the letter, and we find this in verse 8. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the first and the last who was dead and has come to life says this. This greeting of the letter is to Smyrna from Jesus. Where is Smyrna? What do we know about Smyrna? Smyrna was called the city most beautiful of Asia. Its nickname was the crown of Asia. It was on a gulf of the Aegean Sea, a very well-protected harbor that stands to this day. It was second only to Ephesus in trade. It was therefore a very wealthy city. It was famous for its stadium in which it held games. It had a public library and the largest public theater in Asia. It was the birthplace of Homer. And by New Testament times, some 200,000 people lived there. Stamped on its coins were the phrases, first of Asia in beauty and in size. Next, we meet Jesus in this greeting. He refers to himself as the first and the last who was dead and has come to life. This pulls from the vision we looked at in chapter 1, specifically verses 17 and 18. There, John says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He placed his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and Hades. It's interesting that the city of Smyrna itself had undergone something of a resurrection. It was destroyed in 627 BC by the king of Lydia, and then it was pretty much off the map for three centuries. It was reduced basically to village life. It was rebuilt in 290 B.C. by Antigones as an ideal city. It was one of the few cities of the ancient world with a pre-plan of how it would be laid out. Kind of built from the beginning up for its beauty. In its rebuild, it became known as the crown of Asia. Greek literature refers to the phoenix bird as the emblem of Smyrna. I don't know how often you think about the mythology of the phoenix in relationship to our own city. The the phoenix bird was was supposedly the, the bird that would die in a ball of flame, just go down in fire, and then out of the ashes would rise a regenerative phoenix bird. To fly again. And so the, anytime somebody's age was to be compared to something, they would say, may his glory live 12 phoenixes. And the idea was the phoenix bird would rise out of the ashes to new glory. And the city of Smyrna wore the badge of the phoenix on its inscriptions. It had itself had undergone a demolition only to rise to new splendor out of the ashes of its prior demise. And while the residents of Smyrna would resonate with their city's history and its honor and its beauty, the more poignant reference here for believers would be the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Notice what Jesus says about himself, and this is a contrast to the city. The first and the last who was dead and has come to life says this. Jesus became dead. Why? Why did Jesus become dead? No accidental death. Jesus came to earth so that he could die. So that he as a substitute could pay for the sins of all who would believe in him. And Jesus of course experienced a resurrection. He said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord and I take it up again by myself. Jesus emptied his own tomb. He conquered death, victorious over death. And his resurrection proves that his payment for sin was acceptable before his father. And it demonstrates that he, the author of life, was stronger than death. He conquered death, victorious over death. 
which is great news for all who would be attached to him. You want to be on the team of the one who's stronger than death, given that the mortality rate hovers right around 100%. This is critical encouragement given what the church at Smyrna was about to face. With them in their suffering was one who experienced death and conquered death. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. As one pastor has said, Christ's death and subsequent life, as well as his eternal nature, are especially relevant to those to whom he promises life subsequent to their death for his sake. If Jesus writes a letter to the church and says, you're suffering now, it's going to get worse, be faithful unto death, it's going to be really helpful to get this letter from the one who has beaten death. And guarantees victory to those who belong to him. Jesus transcended physical suffering. He transcended mortality. He alone can promise the same for those loyal to him. We looked then at verse 9. And, and this is the commendation part of the letter. In each of these letters we find things that the churches are doing right. And things that they're doing wrong. Here is the commendation. Here's what they are doing right. Jesus says, I know. Again, those comforting words from the omniscient one, the eyes with the flame of fire, they are everywhere. Jesus sees everything. He knows everything. He knows every heart. And he knows particularly the situation that his church is under. And so his familiar, familiarity with their struggle is a source of comfort. He says, first of all, I know your affliction. The word for affliction here is the word for pressure, pressure a restricting pressure that burdens the spirit. In a literal sense, it referred to the pressure of a large weight on top of something. And of course, as a metaphor, it means that which just weighs us down, that which is a burden. What was the pressure they faced? They, they faced pressure from the culture around them that was given over to pagan idolatry. They faced pressure from the government which was given over to emperor worship. And they faced pressure from their community, a hostile Jewish community in Smyrna. And, and the word Smyrna itself, the city's name, means bitter. In fact, the word is the, the word for myrrh. Uh, that aromatic spice, it's a, it's a, it's a bitter plant used to make an a aero, a aromatic perfume that was used in embalming. In fact, the modern city that's there is mirror, still has that word mirror in it. The resin of that plant was used as a perfume and, and particularly used for embalming the dead. And, and so myrrh throughout history has had connotations of sorrow and suffering and mourning and death. This is myrrh as in gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And you remember, those are the three categories of gifts brought to baby Jesus by the kings of the earth. And it's interesting that those kings brought to baby Jesus aromatic spices used for embalming the dead, almost as if God knew what he was doing. But when you come to Isaiah chapter 60, verse 6, kings of the earth are said once again to show up to Jerusalem and visit Jesus, but not baby Jesus, King Jesus when he rules on the earth. And do you know what Isaiah 60, verse 6 lists as the gifts these kings of the earth bring? Gold and frankincense. And you're saying, and, and? They don't bring myrrh. That was a side sermon. Sorry about that. Back to Smyrna. <laughs> The, the very name of the city brought up these connotations of, of sorrow and death. Jesus says, I know your affliction. And he says also, I know your poverty. There, there are two significant words in the New Testament for poverty. One means you don't have anything superfluous. You're paycheck to paycheck. You don't get the luxuries that everybody else has. You're living in a city where everybody else has wealth and is consumed by wealth, and you don't get any of those things. You're just making it. And the other word for poverty is the word for abs absolute destitution. You have nothing at all. And that's the word that's used here of the believers in Smyrna. We'll discover the reason for their poverty in just a moment. 
But Jesus gives this little aside. Do you see this in parentheses in your English Bible? I know your tribulation and your poverty, verse 9, but you are rich, Jesus says. <laughs> Isn't that a great reminder? What is the richness here? Uh, as one has said, this is the unapproachable wealth of a devoted life. That is the, the richness of what it means to belong to Jesus. To say, you, you can have the whole world, but give me Jesus. I am rich beyond all measure if I have him. If I have him, I've got forgiveness of sin and the purchase of eternal life and the guarantee of the inheritance in his presence forever. And you can take everything this world has to offer. Absolute destitution in this life in Christ means infinite riches. Let goods and kindred go, Martin Luther saying. This mortal life also. The body they may kill. God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Jesus is reminding them who they are and whose they are. Notice the contrast to another letter, the last letter, the letter to Laodicea. In verse 17, Jesus indicts them and says, Because you say, I am rich and I am wealthy and I don't need anything, but you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Do you understand the reversal there? The believers at Smyrna had nothing in the world, but they had everything in Christ. The so-called believers at Laodicea claimed wealth and had physical things, and they did not have Christ. And of course, the indictment there in that last letter, Jesus says, I will spit you out of my mouth in judgment. Now, this comfort to Smyrna is such a help doesn't matter what you have in your bank account. If you have Christ, you have everything. And Jesus says, and I know your enemies. I know the blasphemy of those who call themselves Jews, but they're not. They are a synagogue of Satan. This is reminiscent of John 8, 44. Jesus speaking with the Jews uh, during his earthly ministry. And he says, you claim Abraham as your father. Let me tell you who your dad is. Satan. In other words, there's an outward form of religiosity and there is a heredity of, of, of lineage aligning itself with God's promises and His Word, but there is no personal faith. And Jesus says, you don't actually belong to me. No matter what your heredity, no matter what your religious affiliation, no matter your religious attendance and ceremonies and all the rest, until you are born again by faith, you are of Satan's progeny. This is the same indictment here of the Jews in Smyrna who did not embrace the Jewish Messiah, Jesus. And there was a large Jewish population in Smyrna. They were hostile towards Christians. They were especially hostile towards converts from Judaism. They turned Christians in for not worshiping Caesar or for not worshiping the pagan deities. And they plundered their property. And these Jews in Smyrna became strange bedfellows with the pagan and Roman scene in their persecution of Christians. They had a common enemy. There was the active pagan religious scene in Smyrna. Kind of domineering the, uh, the skyline was Mount Pagus, 500 feet above the harbor. And on this mountain, maybe you can imagine Camelback Mountain sort of looming over Paradise Valley. That's sort of the picture here. At the top of this mountain was a circle of colonnaded buildings right at the crest of the hill. And that colonnade of buildings, or those columned buildings at the top, were called the Crown of Smyrna. There was a famous street that sort of connected all of these buildings called a street of gold and it gleamed in the sunlight and it curved around that hill like a necklace connecting all of those buildings. On one end was the temple of Zeus, on the other end was the temple of Sybil and in between were temples to Asclepios and Apollo and Aphrodite. In other words, overlooking the entire city was the worship of pagan deities and all that went with that. And the local trade guilds held festivals for these pagan deities. They, they held dinners in honor of the deities. And in order to work in the trade guilds, you had to show up at these festival dinners and pay homage to the deities. It was your union dues. Don't pay your union dues, you don't get your card, you can't work. No pagan worship, 
no employment. It meant economic ruin and financial destitution for Christians in Smyrna. There was also the emperor cult. Caesar, who was called Lord, the Greek word kurios, it is the most prominent title for Jesus in the New Testament. And Caesar took this name for himself. This, of course, would be a direct offense to Christians whose very confession is at its base, Jesus is Lord. We're not allowed to say someone else is Lord. Under Domitian, who ruled the Roman Empire from 81 to 96 AD, right during the time period this letter was written, under Domitian, emperor worship was made mandatory. And those who did not worship the emperor were subject to death, capital punishment. And the way you worshiped the emperor was once a year, you had to burn incense to the emperor and get a certificate to prove that you had done it. Listen, you, you didn't even have to mean it. This was political procedure. This was politics of unifying the empire under one thing, one flag, one banner, one anthem. Just say, Caesar is Lord, get your certificate, and move on with life. Caesar didn't demand worship from the heart. He didn't demand obedience and compliance with genuine affections. All you needed was the certificate. And the Christians wouldn't do it. The hostile Jewish community whose religious scruples were protected. Here's the great irony. The Jews didn't have to burn incense to Caesar and they didn't have to get an employment card from the worship of pagan deities. They actually were protected as Jews. They got a free pass. So when they were offended at people who had converted from Judaism to following Messiah, they said, you're de synagogue, you're no longer under the protective banner of Judaism. Then the Christians were vulnerable. And the Jewish community was eager, more than happy, to turn Christians into the authorities for violating the laws. Call the cops. I got someone over here who's not burning incense. Wait, aren't they Jewish? Nope, they're not with us. Punishable by death, unable to work. And the Christians then suffered six kinds of slander. They were called atheists because they wouldn't worship the pagan deities. They were called unpatriotic because of their political disloyalty for not saying Caesar is Lord. They were accused of breaking up homes, right? One person comes to faith in a household and look what you're doing. You're just separating people. You're haters. They were accused of being incendiary and riotous because trouble just seemed to follow them everywhere. They, they were disturbers of the public peace. And they were accused of being immoral. And this got out because uh, people assumed that their love feasts were something other than dinner after church and that the brother-sister relationships were incestuous. And those rumors spread. And then they were accused of cannibalism. Of course, at the Lord's table, they talk of eating flesh and drinking blood. They, they missed the metaphor and they took it literally. Or at least the rumor put it out there that Christians were cannibalistic. These six areas of slander were, of course, baseless. But it didn't matter. The damage was done. It didn't matter what the truth was to the enemies of truth. And listen, we are starting in our own day to see hints of this very kind of thing, this same kind of pressure. Christians have already been prosecuted for upholding biblical discipline of children, for denying services in a free market economy, to those that compromise their convictions about marriage and sexuality, the state has already been employed to leverage power and punishment against Christians for holding conviction. Christians, by the way, which ought to be the best citizens of any land they find themselves in. They pay their taxes, they obey the speed limit, right? Um, they say, as far as I can, I will be the best citizen that this country knows. I'll lay down my life for my brother. But I won't call Caesar Lord. And I can't go down the paths of immorality and, and I can't sacrifice biblical truth. And the irony for the first three centuries of Christian martyrs is they appealed to the emperors and they said, we're your best citizens. 
We just won't say Caesar is Lord. And, and we should say the same thing today. Romans 13, obey the government, pay your taxes, do what you're supposed to do. Oh, tax day is tomorrow, isn't it? <laughs> Got to write those checks. We as a church have had to take steps to protect ourselves from the legal threats of those who would be hostile to the truth. And for hostility's sake alone, seek to bring legal action against a church. The day is coming in this country when if you do not pay homage to the institutions, the pagan, the immoral, the blasphemous ones, you will not be able to operate freely. The pressure to compromise fidelity to Christ increases daily, and we may soon find that faithfulness to Christ may result in financial ruin or imprisonment or worse. Listen, Jesus knows. I know the blasphemy of those. I know who they are. Jesus knows the enemies are in the wrong, and Jesus is sovereign. You might think for a moment, well, Jesus, if you know all this, why don't you do something about it? Jesus, can, can you read to those guys the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence? Can't you set them straight? Can't you just, te- did I confuse metaphors there for a second? Can't you just tell everybody that Christians are sincere and, and they want the truth and they're not haters and, and they actually love people with unstoppable love? And that's not Jesus' promise here to the church at Smyrna. He says, I know your enemies. And listen, sometimes we can spin our wheels trying to correct every wrong impression, every misrepresentation, but know this, Christian, Jesus knows, Jesus sees, and he will hold every enemy accountable, maybe not the next second, but in his time. And we hear the injunction of the apostle Peter, therefore those who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. That is the commendation. Interesting commendation. I know what you're going through. (laughs) Next, we see the confrontation. Look down at your Bibles. Okay, next, the command. (laughs) Did you notice there was no confrontation here? This church at Smyrna was not confronted by Jesus. Neither will the church at Philadelphia be confronted by Jesus. Those are the two out of the seven that get no reprimand from the Lord. And listen, Smyrna's not perfect. Smyrna is not sinless. But, but Jesus doesn't bring any indictment against them here. Jesus knows them. He, he knows what they're enduring. And, and there's a lesson for us in this silence. Not every sufferer is suffering the consequences of sins that must be rebuked. Do you understand that? To put yourself in the feet of one who is suffering is first to to put yourself there, to, to have compassion, to be sympathetic, to feel alongside of, to ask good questions, to not make assumptions, to to try to garner the weep with those who weep mindset of the New Testament Christian. The Christians at Smyrna are sinners in a mixed condition, still not glorified, still not perfected. And Jesus doesn't take this opportunity to address everything that could be addressed in every individual life. The church there is characterized by being under pressure and Jesus seeks to meet them in their suffering to console them, to give them courage. That leads to the command in verse 10. Do not fear. Literally, stop fearing. Stop fearing. That's the import of the grammar here. It implies that they are afraid and Jesus wants to give them courage. It again goes back to the vision in chapter one. John himself was afraid at the blazing glory of Jesus Christ. Jesus puts his right hand on John and says, do not fear, I'm the first and the last. The, the same message comes here. Don't fear, and, and, and do not fear, notice the phrase in verse 10, what you are about to suffer. 
Something worse than poverty and slander is about to happen to this precious little church. I know you're suffering, and it's about to get worse, says Jesus. He says, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison. Well, that's interesting. Horns and a pitchfork and a guy in a red suit. No, the Satan, the God of this world, employing physical human agency to accomplish his will, is going to throw some of the Smyrnian believers in jail. Satan's behind stuff. You and I do not live in a merely naturalistic universe. There are powers and principalities at work. Satan is behind the scenes. He's a lion roaming the earth seeking whom he may devour. What is his play here? Satan wants you to renounce your faith by creating conditions of physical suffering in your life. Listen, do you feel that tug? Physical suffering? Oh, God's no good. It's not worth following Jesus. I could renounce Christ and have comfort. Whether that comes from Satan personally, he's, by the way, singularly present. He is not omnipresent, and there's 8 billion people on the earth. But he has minions, helpers called demons, fallen angels, and they're about this business. And Satan and his legions have allies in the human heart. And you know this, in, in, in your residual flesh, what happens when you face physical suffering? Pressure of any kind, but, but perhaps particularly physical suffering. The removal of comfort, the removal of provision, the removal of luxury, the removal of vacations, the removal of financial space to breathe. Starvation, sickness, cancers. What churns up in our hearts? We... We, tempt, we are tempted to doubt God's goodness, to question God's purpose, to attempt to rewrite His script. God, you, you're, you're on the throne, but I don't like the way you're running the universe. I think it should be done this way. You don't know what you're doing. Those thoughts are inside us. Those thoughts have to be brought under the banner of biblical truth. Satan wanting to cast Smyrnian believers into prison is a scare tactic. Listen, if Satan can get some of those followers of Jesus thrown in jail, what will it say to all the other potential followers of Jesus? Uh, I don't want to go to jail. I just burn incense, get the certificate go about my business, get my, pay my union dues at the Asclepios temple, and, and, we're, and we're just good. I, I don't need my life to be meddled with, with the, with the trouble that Jesus brings. And, and the great irony here is Satan cannot thwart God's work in the heart. You've heard it said that the martyr's blood was the seed of the church. The great contrast here is that as Christians are persecuted, the true believers and the false believers get sorted out. Uh, Who, as a hypocrite, wants to cling to Jesus when it costs? So persecution brings purification of the church. True believers cling because they say with Martin Luther, let goods and kindred go, I have Jesus. That's forever. Satan can't ultimately thwart God's purpose. This encouragement is helpful because it reminds the believers at Smyrna and it reminds us today that back of Satan, behind Satan and his evil schemes, is our sovereign God. Satan is always on a short leash. He had to ask permission to try Job. He had to ask permission to sift Peter He has never let loose to do it every once in your life apart from God's sovereign purposes. And God says he ordains all things, orchestrates all things, including Satan and his minions and the world and your flesh to bring about your good for his glory, Romans 8, 28. The devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested. This isn't the kind of testing that brings about approval. 
Uh, the, the, the trying out of a Navy SEAL where he's tested and the testing produces the kind of man that can go to war. It's, that's a common word for testing. That's the Romans 12, 2 testing of God's will. You, you, you test it out and, and see that it's approved. This is a different word for testing. This is a, a, a testing with the goal of enticing. This is, I'm going to put something hard in your way to try to get you to fumble. Satan has reasons for the godly to suffer. He just hates God's people. He hates God's successes. He wants to discredit God's work. But God himself has reasons for the godly to suffer, even when the suffering comes about by a testing unto enticement from Satan, our arch enemy. Why does God have the godly suffer in this world? I'll just give you several categories. One for discipline. You can look up Hebrews 12 and 1 Corinthians 11. Both of those chapters deal with God's discipline of His beloved. To, to correct that which is off track. Secondly, to promote humility. You think 2 Corinthians 11, after Paul got a view of the third heavens and the glorious vision there, God says He gave Paul a thorn in the side, an affliction, a very personal, close, painful trial. Why? To keep him from exalting himself. It was a preventive measure against pride. And God can bring that in to keep us humble. God brings in suffering for growth, both individual and corporate. Romans 5 details the, the benefits of suffering, produces endurance, and all that we need for the Christian life. In fact, the more the church is persecuted, the stronger it gets. And you read the book of Acts, and what do you see as the result of suffering of followers of Jesus? The expansion of the gospel to the ends of the earth. God has his purposes in all of these things. One has said the purest Christian graces are those forged in the furnace of adversity. Have we learned to embrace that furnace? Some of you have seen it. Some of you have been in it. Some of you are in it even now. Perhaps in greater measure, those who profess fidelity of Christ will endure a furnace. What was it like for Daniel to walk into a fiery furnace with fidelity to God? Are we ready for such things? Do we appreciate God's purposes in them? Jesus says, you will have tribulation for 10 days. What will this produce? Genuine faith, deep spirituality, serious mindedness, humility, fervency, evangelism, love of truth, devotion to the Lord. This tribulation, affliction, severe pressure, Jesus says, you will have for a limited period of time, 10 days. This is comfort from Christ. Again, it tells us if Jesus knows exactly how long it is, it is because he has written, pre-written future history. The future is as the past to him. If Jesus knows that their affliction, this particular affliction the church at Smyrna would face, was limited to 10 days, that's a comfort. Comfort in its limited duration, I think a bigger comfort in the fact that Jesus knows it, that he's sovereign, that he has his purposes in it. Some have said this is an indefinite period, but a short period of time. I think the 10 days may be a reference, and you can find this in the literature of the day, uh, that, that 10 days or 20 days were often given, in Smyrna in particular, but in a lot of the major Roman cities where they had arenas, the 10 days were festivals of celebration of the Roman Empire, celebration of Roman victories, celebration of Roman power. And these celebrations were held by uh, giving the people lots of food and festivals on the government dime and then providing games for entertainment. And, and the games for entertainment in the, in the arena were often gladiatorial games. And the victims of the gladiators, these mighty, finely tuned, well-trained soldiers with lots of weapons, they were going to go up against the mighty, no, they were going to go up against the puny, unarmed Christians and slaughter them for entertainment in the public square. I think that's what the reference to the 10 days is. Not only gladiatorial games, but wild beasts were kept in cages and then released to devour Christians as blood sport entertainment for the masses. 
You think about a hostile Jewish community looking on going, yeah. And the followers of the pagan deities going, that was dumb. (laughs) The followers of the emperor worship saying, all you had to do was burn a candle once a year and get a piece of paper. What's your problem? Instead, you're choosing to be fed to lions. (sighs) I guess it's entertaining. That is what they faced. Ten days of suffering. By the way, the the throwing into prison, we we think of prison as uh, somewhat restorative or or maybe we think of it as judicial and punitive. You know, somebody has to carry out their sentence. That's not the way prison was used in the ancient world. It was used for political prisoners. It was used for criminals who were being held until their trial and then their trial would determine their fate, whatever it was, fines or slavery or death. And, and particularly, prisons were held for those who were condemned to death. And so going to prison was not like, hey, uh, I'll, I'll be out in 10. You're not getting out. Either you're being held for trial and then you're going to face your punishment. But, but after conviction, being held imprisonment uh, just meant waiting for the next set of games for you to be executed. And notice what Jesus says, be faithful until death. Keep on proving faithful, Christians, until death. This is not the encouragement we want from Jesus. I know you're suffering. Don't worry. It's going to get better. There's light around the corner. There's light at the end of the tunnel. Good vibes. Jesus says, be faithful unto death. It's not getting better. The word faithful meant a lot to the population at Smyrna, not just to the Christians. The city was called Faithful Unto Rome. It was one of its nicknames. In 195 BC, the city of Smyrna built a temple dedicated to the worship of Rome and was rewarded. In 95 BC, the Roman general Sulla needed winter clothes for his army fighting in the cold. He showed up at the city of Smyrna and the people of Smyrna took off their warm clothes on the spot and gave it to the army. In 23 AD, Smyrna beat out all other cities in the empire to be awarded a temple built to the imperial cult, the worship of the emperor. And inscriptions and literature from the day, their coins, their uh, monuments speak of Smyrna as faithful, meaning faithful to Rome. The city prided itself in this so-called virtue. For Jesus to say, Smyrnian believers, be faithful unto death, he's appealing to the nickname of the city and telling them, be faithful to me. He addresses the misplaced fidelity, faithfulness to the one true God, faithfulness to the King of kings and Lord of all lords will bring about victory over death. This is the refrain of Jim Elliot, one of the... Uh, martyrs, missionary martyrs who was slain on the banks of the Kurere River taking the gospel to, to people groups who had never heard. Jim Elliot wrote before he was martyred, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. It's a great summary of what Jesus promises here. Jesus says, I will give you the crown of life. And crown here is the word stephanos, not diadem. Diadem was the the gold and jewel-bedecked crown of kings made of really costly materials. The Stephanos was a wreath made out of leaves, made out of branches, twigs. It was a garland. It was given in victory to athletic game winners and to victorious soldiers in battle. It was given for honor of public service. The value was not in the materials of the crown but in what it stood for. And here it stands for ultimate victory, eternal life, victory over death, and Jesus promises it to all who are faithful to him. This, of course, is a contrast to the city of Smyrna, which was called the crown of Asia, and Mount Pagus, which was called the crown of Smyrna. Visible, the, these visible features would be what the believers there saw every day. It would be like living in Tempe and seeing a mountain. You just drive by it, you see it all the time, you kind of forget about it. And Jesus says, I will give you the crown. Using the imagery of a crown of life in a city called the crown and resembling a crown, Jesus seemed to give his precious church a helpful, visible reminder of his promises. After reading this letter, the people at Smyrna would say, oh yeah, Jesus is giving us the crown of life, be faithful. And they would see the crown on the mountain. 
They would live in the city called the crown and they would remember this promise. Really helpful. It's interesting that this is the only letter of the seven without a promise of the Lord's imminent return. It seems that the immediacy of their suffering was on Jesus' heart here. I, I hope this morning that you long to be faithful to Christ. Faithfulness to Christ does not mean that you love suffering. Right? Don't get a martyr's complex here. Oh yeah, I just want to suffer. I want the glory of suffering. That, that, that's not a helpful perspective. What we ought to long for is faithfulness to Christ. And, and in case you're worried about the state of your own heart, I, I'm actually afraid of lions. I saw the movie Gladiator. I, I don't want to be unarmed in the arena. I don't want to go to jail for disciplining my children. I, I don't want to lose tax-exempt status as a church. I, I don't, whatever it is that's coming. It, those things are fearful. You don't have to muster up courage right now. I can face down any lion, any IRS audit or whatever. You just have to muster up fidelity to Christ, which is dependent on Him. Look to Him. What's amazing in, in the history of the martyrs, particularly the, the first three centuries of Christian martyrs, they're, they're little kids and, and they're housewives and, and they're just simple, impoverished Christians, they're, they're not the guys who, who, who won all the strength contests. They're not the best and the brightest and the smartest and the burliest. They just had a really strong Savior who strengthened them in the moment that they needed. Listen to the words of Augustine. He said, a man may love to endure, but he does not love what he endures. That's okay. The plea from Jesus comes in verse 11. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Right? We talked about this last week. In CB radio jargon, this is, you got your ears on? Are you on frequency? Can you hear what I'm saying? Those born of the Spirit will hear spiritual things. This again is a gracious invitation from Jesus for anybody listening. Anybody can hear the broadcast and, and maybe CB radio it just isn't making any sense. Uh, you can say, do you have bars? Can you hear me now? Are, are, are you close to a tower? <laughs> are you hearing what I'm saying? This is designed to encourage other Christians, not just at Smyrna, but any Christian from any of the seven churches undergoing suffering personally. And it's designed for all believers in all eras who would listen and hear these words to get courage from Jesus Anyone who would face similar pressures. A universal application to all churches. And the message is to all of us, you too, be faithful under fire. Be faithful. And here's the promise, second half of verse 11. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. The overcomer. Again, that's where we get our Nike, uh, our Nike brand. Our uh, sports brand, Nike. The Greek verb, nikao, overcomer, victorious, champion. They're the one who overcomes. And we know from John's own writings, 1 John 5, that the overcomer is defined as the one who believes the gospel, the one who believes in Jesus. By definition, an overcomer. The overcomer will not be hurt, Jesus says, by the second death. There are a couple ways to say no in Greek. Um, you know, it, it, we might compare it to a young man asking a young lady out for coffee. And if she says, uh, you can ask again. If she says, mm, no, young man, try it again. If she uses the Greek phrase here, it's, it's ume, right? If, if, if you ask a young Greek girl out and she says ume, don't ask again. It's, there ain't no way. Case closed, game over, just forget about it. That's the word used here. The second death will in no way conceivable hurt you. That's the promise from Jesus for the overcomer. What is the second death? You could fast forward to Revelation 20, verse 14. The second death is for all those whose names are not found written in the Lamb's book of life, and they are cast forever into the lake of fire. That is the second death. Revelation 21 describes who the second death is for. All liars, all the immoral, and gives a vice list that includes everyone in this room. 
In other words, anyone who meets his maker still with his sins attached to him, condemnable forever in the lake of fire. That's the second death. And there's no escape, no second chance, no way around it. It is appointed for man to die once and then to face judgment. The second death is what Eric was talking to us about during communion this morning. Eternal conscious torment under the wrath of God. The overcomer will not face such things. Smyrna was the church of the eternal perspective. It's the only way to be faithful under fire. To, to believe with Paul in 2 Corinthians 4, light and momentary afflictions produce for us an eternal weight of glory. Or Romans 8.18, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. These things could only be encouraging if the second death is conquered, if victory is assured. Think back at this letter for a moment at the source of encouragement. Verse 8 is all about your knowledge of Christ, who He is and what He's done. Verse 9 is about Christ's knowledge of you, your situation, your affliction, poverty, the slander against you. Verse 10 is all about Christ's knowledge of the future. He is omniscient and sovereign and there are no surprises to Him. Even your suffering is not a surprise to Him. And then finally in verse 11, your knowledge of the future. Faith in Christ, victory over the second death. Faith, trust, rest. Christian, you need to know your Bibles. You need to know your Savior. Little bit of knowledge, big fears. Lots of knowledge, clinging to God's word, believing the truth of God's word, and the fears shrink. Polycarp, it's a funny name, sounds like many fish. <laughs> Polycarp was a disciple of the Apostle John. Polycarp was a member of the church at Smyrna. He is called, in fact, the 12th martyr of Smyrna. Polycarp was commanded to recognize Caesar as Lord. And he said in response, 80 and 6 years I have served the Lord Jesus and he never wronged me. How then could I blaspheme my king and my savior? He's not burning incense to the emperor. He's not even going to say with his lips, Jesus the Lord. He doesn't even, he's not even going to entertain the idea of a political procedure to get out of trouble. Of course, the Roman officials were offended. It's interesting that he calls it blasphemy. How could it be blasphemy just to go through a political procedure, get a certificate, say some words, not even mean it? Um, it's a compromise. It's a compromise over who is Lord. You confess the Lord Jesus with your mouth. You're ashamed to confess Jesus before men, and Jesus said, I will be ashamed of you before my Father. Polycarp knew what was at stake. So they threatened him with being fed to the wild beasts in the arena. He would not yield, and, and this got under the skin of the official. I, what do you mean? I, I just told you we're, we're going we're gonna to put you in the middle of the, of the sports arena and we're going to let the lions off of their chains. They're, they're going to eat you alive. I don't care. Oh, okay. Uh, man, that didn't scare him. What, now, what can we try? Fire. We're going to burn you until you stop breathing. And again, he said, I don't care. Well, this is what, that was a paraphrase. Here's what he said. You threaten me with fire which burns for an hour and after a little is extinguished, but you are ignorant of the fire of coming judgment and of eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. Why do you tarry? Bring forth what you will. Does it seem like Polycarp read this letter over and over and over again? The, the letter that Jesus wrote to his church. Church history tells us that the Jews of Smyrna actually gathered wood on the Sabbath in order to burn Polycarp. That shows you their hypocrisy and compromise. And they refused to let other Christians bury the remains. Polycarp was not alone. Masses of Christians were executed out of Smyrna. I'll turn your attention to Psalm 5611. The psalmist writes, in God I have put my trust, I shall not be afraid, what can man do to me? Let's pray.
our gracious God, our Father, the one who commissioned his beloved Son to come and to die, to suffer in our place. We humble ourselves under your mighty hand that you may exalt in the proper time. We cast our anxiety on you, O God, because you care for us. Let us be sober of spirit and on the alert. O Lord, we have an adversary, the devil, who prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Help us, O God, to resist him. Make us firm in our faith. We know that these same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by our brethren all over the world, even now. After we have suffered for a little while, O God, you who are full of grace, you who call us to your eternal glory in Christ, you will perfect and confirm and strengthen and establish us. To you be dominion forever and ever. Amen.